started at the Kitchen Studios. This is the Pencil Pushers Podcast. Welcome, Leadheads. This is the Pencil Pushers Podcast, and I'm your host, Mike Rosado. Today, we talk with Tony White, an award-winning animator who's been a passionate artist and advocate for hand-drawn animation for close to 50 years. To give a peek into his illustrious career, he's worked with such icons in the industry like Art Babbitt, Ken Harris, and Richard Williams, ran his own animation studio for 20 years, has written numerous books, and as a lecturer and educator has helped leagues of up-and-coming students to develop their skills in this incredible field. As an avid 2D animation fan myself since childhood, I couldn't be more excited to have him here and pick his brain for an hour. So let's give him a warm welcome to my Facebook friend, Mr. Tony White. How are you doing, Tony? I'm fine, Mike. Thank you for asking me, and thanks for having such a terrific idea for a podcast. Looking thanks. forward to the rest of them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Definitely excited myself uh, just getting started here. Um, so yeah, so, so Tony and I have known each other, uh, via Facebook. That's why I put that little joke in there. We've known each other via Facebook for, um, probably about four or five years or so, I would guess. Isn't that right, Tony? Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. It's, I, I can't even remember how long I've been on Facebook. Sometimes they pop up those posts and say seven years ago or something right. like that. Yeah. You're was like, what? Really? Seven years ago? Oh, hell. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I was a lot thinner back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, but anyway, yeah. So we we have been chatting here and there, passionately talking about animation, uh, and uh, even discovered uh, Tony's uh, Tony's work that I was a fan of when I was a kid, and just realized later on that he was actually uh, one of the key animators on some of that stuff. So it was really cool. So anyway, so um, Tony, I'd like to start talking with you um, about how you first got into art. Tell me about your childhood and how that kind of came to be. Well, I guess as a kid, uh, the one thing I did well and consistently well and loved to do was drawing. Mm. Uh, I was pretty much a loner as a kid. My, my parents, actually, my mother was told she'd never had children, and then somehow I came along. So <laughs> I was that magical child, you know, the only child. So I was brought up in a kind of cosseted environment. But um, I just remember from day one, it's just I drew. I drew all the time. Mm. And... Um, and academically, I was pretty sound, but I never re – the problem I had, I, I froze at exams. So I never got the school passes that I needed to get to the top art schools in the country, in the UK. I see. Uh, but they found a course for me that was heavy on drawing, and it was in graphic design and uh, typography and illustration, and I, I went for it, and I loved every minute of it. Was and that? somehow, and I, and I won awards and I, I did all kinds of things as a student that were pretty, pretty exciting. But when I went out to get a job, I assumed I was just going to walk in, you know, into <laughs> something. And I couldn't. It was a terrible time. British government put tax on employers. They, so they were letting people go. But to cut a long story short, I, um, I was out of work. I had to move back with my parents because I'd moved out of out of home and I had to go back and they were pretty poor. And so how, thought, how old were you at this point? Oh, I must have been, uh, you know, the, the point where I moved back, I must have been 18, 17, 18, like that, something like that. Okay. And, uh, and I felt so bad because I was a drain on their resources that were very little. And I thought, I'm just going to try any job I can get. And uh, this was after graduation. And art, art, was it art-wise or not? Did, did, did it matter or were you just like, whatever kind of job I can find? What I really want, when I was at art school, what I really wanted to do, I wanted to get into advertising, but more as a copywriter, concept, art, uh, concept you know, a writer or a creative team in an advertising mm -hmm. agency. That's in my head. That's what I wanted to do. Sure. Or I wanted to be a children's book illustrator. Okay. And I was really, really lucky at college. My main tutor, the one I loved most, was Ralph Steadman, the illustrator. Oh, wow. And I don't know if you know Ralph Steadman, but he's an incredible artist and a really, really nice guy. And uh, so he was encouraging me a great deal into illustration and gave me contacts with publishers. And I got quite, got so close to publishing books, hmm. but it just never happened. And that's when I felt a bit guilty about living off my parents again. So, <laughs> and I just looked through the trade magazines and I saw 
a uh, an animation studio. I didn't even know we had them in London. I thought everything in animation was done in LA. That's how naive I was. Yeah. We didn't have courses on animation or anything like that. So I saw an animation studio. It said a junior background artist required must have good portfolio of illustration. And I didn't know what a junior background artist was, but I did have a good portfolio of illustration because yeah. working with Ralph Steadman, um, it, it just happened, you know. Yeah. So I went along, and to cut a long story short, again, I out of 30 people I, you know, I we were interviewed, I got the job. And then I turned up day one, and I had no clue what a junior background artist was. And I found, it, I found out very quickly it was the people who create all the art in an animated film that doesn't move, basically. Right. Right. Everything is behind the animated characters. Yeah. And, uh, and I was the, trained the scene there. And of creators. course, it was very old school. No digital, nothing like that. Yeah. What was the name of the studio? Oh, it was Hallison Bachelor, and, and it was a pretty big studio, actually. I didn't know about it because I wasn't focused on animation at the time. But, yeah, Hallison Bachelor created the first ever British animated movie. Oh, what was that one? Animated movie, and it was, uh, you know, um, Animal Farm, of course. Animal Farm. Oh, okay. And, wow. And, and, and that if was you a big look hit. at that movie, it's pretty powerful, and it was oh, yeah. uh, very much, uh, it, it holds up. It holds up after all this time. Mm. Uh, but I didn't work on that, of course. They, they'd long done that, but that was their claim to fame. But John Hallis was a Hungarian refugee during the Second World War, came to London, married Joy Bachelor, who was um, also an artist and an animator. Okay. And they set the studio up that pretty much became the big studio in London at the time. Mm, mm, okay. um, so what, I worked there for what a few year, years. What year is that, by the way? Around um, this time when you got hired? Specifically, it was around the end of the 60s. Yeah, it's the end of the 60s. I can't remember specifically the year, but yeah. it may have been 68, 69, something like that. Okay. Um, so by this time, stayed, the the Yellow Submarine was already out, and you, so that and that was done in uh, London as well, wasn't it? Okay, so that gives you the timing. It reminds me of the timing because actually the job I got at Hallison Bachelor was to replace a guy from the background department who went to work on Yellow Submarine. Okay, right. So he, he, he went on, there was a vacancy, and, and I got that job. Okay. So the Yellow Submarine was responsible, really, for getting me in the animation industry. <laughs> but still, my plan was, uh, I don't know about anything about animation. This would be good for making contacts in the industry, and I can get to advertising, or right. I can get to children's book publishing yeah. through those contacts, and I'll just be here for a while, and it'll pay bills. Now, were they uh, doing advertising themselves? or? Oh, yeah, they did commercials. They, they were making many, many short films. They were quite amazing in, in that sense. In those days, it was possible to make money Money as a company mm -hmm. making short films and John Hallis was ambassador of an organization called ASIFA okay. and he was like the European head of it at the time that meant he he had contacts all across Europe he was the most amazing marketing and promotional guy and uh, they were making films for everywhere with grants and funding and all and, and making money and yes they made commercials as well so okay. It was a really busy studio, and I was very impressed with it. Mm. Creatively and artistically, it wasn't my thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I'll tell you this, the roundabout route was when I was at art school one day, uh, and as I said, we never did animation, but it was mainly illustration and graphic design. Uh, but one day, one of the uh, faculty came in, and he brought a, a short 16 mil film in, and he said, I want you all to watch this film, and, I, and we did. He put it on the old projector in those days, no computers or anything. <laughs> and, uh, and basically, it was a film by a Canadian in London called Richard Williams. Mm -hmm. And he was an up-and-coming filmmaker. Yeah. And uh, it was called Little Island. Oh, wow. And it blew me away because when I saw it, it was nothing like Tom and Jerry or, the Ro or you know, Disney or anything like that. It was very stylistic and minimalistic yep. in many yep. ways. But I loved it. Almost had kind of a UPA sort of feel to it, didn't it? It was, yeah. It was very much of that kind of influence, and um, and and he was he wasn't he didn't have his studio at that stage. He was just making the film. He worked for a company called Wyatt and Catania, okay. and they were the big the, the big company for advertising at the time. Uh, and he was storyboarding for them, and I think designing characters. But he made this film, which eventually enabled him to set up his own studio. Okay. Um, 
So we're, after a few years at Allison Bachelor, I remember. Oh, and then I remember seeing Richard Williams' Charge of the Light Brigade mm. movie titles. He did them for an Anthony Richards yep. Richardson film called Charge of the Light Brigade, and they blew me away. They were just so exquisitely beautiful. Yep, very um, illustrative. Yeah. It, it was very much in the style of the crosshatch engraving style, yep. the political cartoons of the time yep. when the Charge of the Light Brigade happened. And then, um, and what, so I was at Hallison Batcher for a few years and I was really going nowhere creatively. It mm -hmm. was a good job and, and very good studio discipline to mm -hmm. learn the industry. I learned everything from them, or at least up to that point, I'd learned everything I could from them. And I, and then I suddenly found this guy, Richard Williams, had a studio in London. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so I essentially wrote to him and said, hey, any jobs going? Because I'd really, I loved your work. Um, I'd love to come for an interview sometime. And uh, he actually did see me. He wrote back personally and said, uh, yeah, come and see me. And uh, effectively, I had a, an interview with him. I showed him my work. He said, I love your work. Oh, wow. I love your illustrations. I love everything you're doing. He said, unfortunately, I don't have a job right now, but you're top of my list. Wow. So that, that, went, that, that in and of I, itself is an incredible compliment. <laughs> Even if you didn't get the job, somebody like Richard Williams to say that is incredible. Well, it gets better. So, so the unfolding story is I, I suffered. I ended up as head of design and color on a for Hallison Bachelor, okay. uh, a TV se series called The Jackson Five. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It looks so dated right. and embarrassing now. But I was head of design and uh, color on that one. Okay. And I was so fed up, so fed up, because it was <laughs> it was a sausage meat factory on working on TV productions. Yep. It really was. Very, very limited animation. Yeah, and I, I, and I wanted to be an animator, but there was no one there I wanted to learn animation from because the animation was limited. Yeah. So I thought, I'm going to give Richard Williams one more try. And if not, I'm going to head off to Canada and try and get into the Canadian Film Board because that was the only place I could see anything significant happen yeah. happening that was moving animation on. And I sent another letter to Richard Williams. And, and as happens in my life, when it seems everything's lost, something happens and I, my timing's immaculate. The day my letter arrived on his desk, somebody resigned from his studio. Mm. And so he said, come over, can you start tomorrow? And I said, no, I've got to give him four weeks notice. Right. Um, and so I served that four weeks notice and joined them. And I got to the, so there I was floating on cloud nine because this, my hero, it was yeah. more, my hero more than any Disney animator, more than anyone. Yeah. And there I was going to, I was going to work for him. And I turned up on day one, checked in at the reception desk and said, my name's Tony White. I've, I, Richard Williams has given me a job, but I don't know where it is or who I'm with or anything. And she said, oh, oh, yeah, you're Richard Williams' assistant. And, like, my jaw hit the ground like, a, <laughs> <laughs> like an old cartoon film uh, with a clanging sound. And, yeah, so I became his assistant, his personal assistant. So this is a good place to pause because before we go any further, I want to ask you, what was that point? where you came from being a background or an assistant background artist to the point where you were like, I want to become an animator. How did it progress from, from that point to automatically saying, no, I think animation is it like specifically uh, actually, being an animator. It, yeah. That process happened very quickly after I started at Hanson bachelor. Um, as I said, I was really going to sit it out and look for a networking and get into the indus into the industry. I wanted to be in, but I swear, after about 10 days, I suddenly realized I totally loved this world. Yeah. I loved animation. I loved everything about it. And unfairly to the guy who trained me, because I really apprenticed with a guy who was a very experienced background artist. Mm -hmm. um, sadly for him, after about four or five weeks, where I'd really learned all the technical details of background art mm -hmm. and all the things you needed to know, mm -hmm. they fired the poor guy and then just promoted me to become a full background artist. Oh, wow. um, and I felt so bad. And I thought every, everyone loved this guy in the studio. I thought everyone's going to see me as the villain here. And I'm really <laughs> don't want to be. And, uh, the, but they treated me really well. I just yeah. felt so bad for him because he was such a nice guy, yeah. but it was really cost saving for the studio. They, I was a cheaper salary yep. and they got rid of the higher ones. So, but in answer to your question, I loved after about 10 days, I realized this was my industry. And I, 
didn't want to leave after that. Mm -hmm. And and how long were you there before you moved into working with uh, Richard? I, I think it was about four or five years. Oh, okay. So you were there for quite a while. Yeah. And in the process, uh, they were taken over at one point. Uh, John Hallis was always there. Um, but they were taken over by a company called Time Tees Television, which was in the north of England, a TV okay. company. Yeah. And they... Um, they sent a managing director to, to run the place, and it really transformed. It became very creatively innovative. Mm. It, it rely on just the old style things, and they were pushing new ground. Mm. And some great people like Jeff Dunbar got were in there, and uh, and a couple of others. Um, yeah. And uh, and it enabled me. Funny enough. Um, I did get my moments of creative freedom. Um, I saw that the Chicago Film Festival were, were um, holding a competition. It was called the One Minute Condition of Man competition. And basically, they wanted animated films in one minute long that kind of defined the condition of the human being, you know? Wow. Okay. And I did a short film called Quartet. I didn't animate it. I couldn't animate it. A good friend of mine in the studio, John Perkins, animated it. Okay. But I directed and designed it and wrote it and everything. And it actually won. <laughs> it actually oh, wow. won <laughs> in Chicago. And then I did another one called A Short Tall Story. This is where my love of children's storytelling came out. Yeah. I wrote a story called the short, A Short Tall Story, which is a, a film for peace, really. It was about mm. these two kinds of strange creatures one lived with their heads beneath the clouds and one lived with their heads above the clouds they never met and they were very suspicious of each other and they, they ended up fighting but eventually it, there's a happy ending and that film actually got adopted by the united nations for promoting peace around the world amazing so, that yeah. was a, that was 1970 right that was in the early 70s, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so oh, what was the span of time between the first letter you sent to Richard and the second one where he actually invited you? It was more or less one year. Okay. And, um, and as a sex, so day one, I was just uh, both so exhilarated and shaking like a leaf. I bet. Because I was so nervous about meeting him. Yeah. I'm, and, a, I'm a grown but, man, and I would have done the same thing. <laughs> 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 well, I just, you know, I'd met him once and he did show me a great deal of respect. And so I felt safe with him. Yeah. But I was in awe of him because even though at that point he hadn't won any of his three Oscars or anything like that. Okay. Um, he was, you know, in my mind, he was the finest animator anywhere. And that's not to put down the Disney animators because they yeah. were the nine old men, etc. Uh, <laughs> it's just that he's concept and his art and his creative ambition with what he was doing with animation was so impressive to me. Yeah. For, for, uh, for the listeners out there who aren't aware, Richard Williams is arguably probably the, not only the, the greatest living animator, but perhaps the greatest animator of all time. I mean, I, I would probably, you've, you've got Milk Call and you've got Richard Williams. Um, <laughs> and I might put Richard Williams above Milk Call, perhaps. I don't know how you feel about that, but that gives some context. And 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 some context as to why you were shaking like a leaf when you first started working with him. Totally. Yeah. 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 And, and I was an innocent with, with regard most of animation because I still, even at Hallison Bachelor, I was very closeted and, and, and removed from the bigger picture of world animation and especially Hollywood animation. Mm -hmm. It was all European and, and these strange, uh, not strange, they, they were kind of some really good films Hallison Bachelor made, but they were very individualistic in the House and Bachelor way yeah. um, and reflected European tastes and styles. But Richard Williams, of course, Canadian, came to Europe and brought the sensibility of American Mm. animation and specifically Hollywood. So my, my world opened up when I started to learn from him mm. about Milk Cole and Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson and all those, those amazing guys. Um, and I bet there was a and, little bit of kinship there too, because I think his mother was an illustrator for advertising companies. I think so. And he, he worked a lot for advertising, I think in Canada, yeah. I think he was an illustrator in advertising and then, I th I think he then he went to you because he was interested in jazz. He played plays the flugelhorn mm -hmm. or he played the flugelhorn mm -hmm. at one point. And I think he hung out on Mediterranean beaches at one time and just hung out as a jazz musician and right. everything and just 
trip, made trips to London to, to earn money, to do storyboarding and whatever he could do. Sure. Uh, and then he, he found his roots in London from an animation perspective. So what happens when you, uh, what, I, I wanted to get some clarity. So you were an, you were the assistant to, to Richard Williams, but is that the assistant animator or, or what, what, what yeah. exactly is the assistant? Yeah, I, I wasn't assistant. No, so, the, so the final cherry on this cake, which I didn't know at the time, he was working on a project that was uh, not untypical of him. It was about three months behind schedule. And I think we had about five months to the deadline, a TV special, a Christmas Carol. Right. And, um, and so he was directing that I was his assistant as an animator. And also I was assigned to assist other people that were working on the production. I was his eyes and ears working with other people like okay. Ken Harris, the great Ken Harris, Warner brother animator. So you, you were, you were Ken Harris's assistant as well. Uh, yes, for two summers. Ken Harris was basically retired, but Dick used to bring him over every summer okay. because Ken Harris loved tennis. So he came over for the Wimbledon Championship. Right. And, uh, and Dick say, would say to him, why don't you stay on and show, show our guys how you animate and teach people and teach us over here in Britain how animation's properly done, not how they think it's done and things like that. And so I was, I was in a unique position. I was assigned to him every sup for two summers to be his assistant. And I worked with him. What does that uh, mean exactly? So walk me, I mean, I, this is just me being kind of a nerd here. I really, you know, I, th nobody will ever have a chance to do this anymore. Even, even the, the younger generation of master animators like an Andreas Deja or, or yeah. Glenn Keane. I mean, they're, they're just fewer and far between for, for those that don't know, Ken Harris is another one of the greatest animators of all time. He was uh, one of the top animators at, Wa at Warner brothers who worked directly under Chuck Jones, Primarily, Chuck Jones basically had uh, the most elite uh, animators, in my opinion. At least they were my favorites. Hands down, one of the best animators of all time. He, mainly, he was famous for B Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner. That yes. was his main... main uh, I, I think he was the number one animator on both of those characters. Right. Uh, so, ju just so people understand, there were two real schools of animation in Hollywood at the time, excuse me, <coughs> it was, um, there was the, uh, there was the Disney studio, which was premier. It, it was like world conquering the, the most amazing place. Yep. Uh, in my opinion. And then also, or in everyone's opinion. Um, and then there was Warner brothers that in their own anarchic renegade way were the greatest other studio, yep. you know, the alternative studio. <laughs> um, they relied much, especially with Chuck Jones, they relied a lot on timing, uh, staging, and gag telling. They made short films, not movies. Yep. And basically, Ken Harris was a master of the minimalist animation. That doesn't mean to say his animation looked bad. It means that he had the skill of knowing exactly what poses, how many in-betweens you put in between those key poses, Mm -hmm. and when not to move something. He, mm -hmm. he was a genius at that. And so in answer to your question, being his assistant, what my job was was to take his key drawings and do the in-between drawings uh, that linked one key drawing to the other. So it could be anything from, I trust me, usually it's for four or five in-betweens. I've had 17 from him I had at that time. Oh, He's wow. that master of slowing things down. Right to a halt and then bam, it would explode into some flurry of move, movement or it would be moving full and then suddenly bam, it would stop and there would be this amazing pose mm. and the humor was in the pose, you know. So um, being his assistant, I would have to do all that work, that so, in-between work, all the right. slog work. You know? Right, right. So you were, you were an in-betweener for, for him. Yeah. yeah. So As I, it was I, to I, Richard Williams and whoever he – assign me to when needs be on the production. I've got to ask, so, so these are the top guys in, in the studio. What was it that Richard saw in you that was so unique? Because you didn't get any schooling in animation. Again, uh, I mean, just talking about it from before, how was it that, what was it that gave him the confidence that you were the person that was able to fill in the blanks for Ken Harris's drawings? Uh, no. Um, 
I, th I think what he the very first time I had the interview, I think the thing he loved was my portfolio of illustration. Because the thing with my illustration, and it wasn't at all influenced by him because um, I really hadn't seen it other than Little Island. I hadn't seen any of his work until I saw the Charge of the Light Brigade titles. But my style was pen and ink. It was intricate, detailed cross-hatching, just okay. like he did and yeah, other yeah. things. Um, there was a big emphasis on black and white. I, I had a kind of a, a style that kind of respe reflected his taste to mm -hmm. some degree. Mm -hmm. And I think also the other thing that he said to me later that although creatively he didn't rate Hallison Bachelor as a groundbreaking artistic studio, it was an incredible production disciplined mm. environment. And he knew I was well trained, you know. Almost like going to a university. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, going through um, an apprenticeship in a craft, yeah. you know, like woodworking or plumbing or something. So he knew I knew the technical and production side of the business. Mm -hmm. And he liked my illustration style. And it fitted with what he was looking for, that detail, attention to detail. I was very patient. I have to tell you that when I first started doing his in-betweens, in, in – are, are you talking uh, about Ken's or Dick's? Uh, Dick Williams. When I first okay. started with Dick Williams, because Ken, I didn't get assigned to Ken until I'd been there about nine months or a year. Dick really needed to test me out. Right. Um, but when I first started, we, as I said, we were working on that film, A Christmas Carol. Now, the, the cherry on the cake I was talking about is that the Christmas Carol actually we found out later, or we it was happened later. It went on to win an Academy Award. That's right. Uh, uh, in the film category, it was, and it was such an amazing body of work. Um, mm -hmm. If people know Richard Williams' work um, and look at the Christmas Carol, it's got faults, but it's an amazing body of work, especially for a TV film. Well, for those who don't know the old school way of animation, what used to happen was we'd do all the drawings on paper. They would then be traced onto acetate cells, mm -hmm. and those cells would then be hand-painted, and then they'd be shot with painted backgrounds on a 35 mil camera. Well, the tradition was that when you did, in, as an in-betweener, you would work on paper. Yeah. Uh, Richard Williams, it wasn't like that for me. It was for some, but it wasn't like that for me. I was actually in-betweening, get this, Ken Harris did the animation of Scrooge, for instance, in the film. Right, on paper. Dick Williams then cleaned up, cleaned up the keys with this wax pencil, finely cross-hatched wax pencil on acetate hmm. and gave me the acetate drawings and I had to in between with acetate cells, Whoa. no paper involved, oh which was God. totally scary, uh, so hard to do. And... Uh, and I started the first week or two doing these, I was so embarrassed because I was doing four drawings a day, right. four or five drawings a day. And I said to him after two weeks, I said, Dick, I'm sorry, I'm so slow. I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed. I hope you're not going to fire me or anything because I'm so slow. And he said, do you know what? I don't care about the speed. He said, the thing is I've checked all your work. It's totally accurate. Wow. And accuracy comes before speed and you'll, you'll eventually pick up speed. But I'm looking at the accuracy because it's important with these guys' work that you, you're, you're accurate. And so uh, I felt totally at ease, even though it was still a challenge and it was scary to do. But I eventually, I think after about three or four months, I was getting up to 12 to 15 drawings a day. Okay. But that's the way he worked. And deadlines really don't mean a lot to him. Yeah. Uh, perfection does. Right. So, so that was that was that was a great initiation. And uh, so, uh, if you do that, you can do anything. <laughs> did 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 you ever feel any pressure from the? Because I think Chuck Jones produced it, right? Uh, Chuck Jones was the executive, executive producer, producer. Yeah, right. And um, who who was funding it? Was it was it like a major uh, television network or? It, it, I can't remember what network it, it went out on. One of the networks can't remember which one, maybe NBC or something, but it was funded by the Foundation for Full Service Banks or something like that. Okay. There were a number of banks in, I think, New York. I didn't really have much to do at that end of it, but I think it was uh, banks wanted to give a gift to the nation for hmm. Christmas time on TV. 
I so see. they funded this whole production. You know, Christmas Carol was the great classic thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, and that's how that came to, to into being. So did it happen on time and on budget, or was it? Okay, so this is the the other reality of working for Richard Williams. So after a <laughs> while, and and I'm not in any way criticizing any of this, but you had to be a certain kind of person to exist at Richard Williams and to love existing at Richard Williams because I would say for the first, sorry, for the final four months or so of the production, we were basically working some anything between 12 to 16 hours a day on the film, yeah. seven days a week, yeah. and no overtime pay. Mm -hmm. you have to you had to do it in a sense of mission or right. inspiration or whatever yeah. and then the f last four days and four nights we worked with no sleep whatsoever not even a nap we mm. worked i didn't think he could do it but we did it and we we made the deadline by one hour there was um <laughs> there was a, a cutoff point where to get the last scene to the cameraman it had to be ready by seven o'clock in the morning, remember it's all on film yeah. to, to get it, to send it to the laboratories for processing. Yeah. And they had an emergency day bath. They called it a day bath, which meant that you could get the print out later in that afternoon, okay. which meant if the print of that last scene in our case was okay, it was cut into the final film and it got on a plane to New York that night. Mm. If it didn't make that plane that night, the studio was going to get sued. We would have gone out of business. There would have been no Richard Williams studio. There would have been oh, nothing, man. but we made it within an hour. But as I said, four days, four nights with no sleep whatsoever. So, so working in that kind of pressure, what was, what was it like in the studio? Were people excited? Were people are just like, oh, you know, this is ridiculous. I want to quit. And how was, how was Richard as a, as a leader under those kinds of scenarios? Well, you, you had the other pressure that he was a perfectionist and a very demanding perfectionist. Yeah. Um, uh, he, he, he was, I wouldn't say he was easy to work with, but he was a genius to work with. And you knew that um, despite that stress and the, those challenges, you were working with the best guy in the world. Yeah. You couldn't be in a better place. So the people who cared about that, I think they stayed because they knew that, like, yeah. uh, like me. You just wanted to be in that place because where were you going to go? Uh, that time Disney was in decline. That was probably the last big studio that was around. I think I can't remember when Warner Brothers closed, but they they pretty much Hollywood was yeah they're giving not it up. The place it used to be yeah, and we were the place it was happening. I mean, yeah. let, to put it in perspective. When, when we the main thing that kept Richard Williams Studio going was advertising. Yep, and our advertising was so cutting edge. It was so in advance of everyone else, and it was such high level of animation quality in general. There were a few bad ones, but in general. Um, and people came from all over the world. We, the film, the, the company won awards in every country where they had awards for animation. And in a single year, the studio won more awards than all the other studios in the world put together. I mean, somebody worked that out one day. So we were at the place of excellence. We were at the, the Bauhaus of animation. You know, it was amazing. Uh, it, so, must have, it must have been something too to to work at an animation studio where you had an actual animator at the helm of everything. Oh yeah, where good and bad, good good and bad. Sure. You know, I love Dick Dearly, the most. As I say, a genius, but he wasn't a good businessman. You know, yeah. so the suit, so. He put art ahead of business, which for me was great. You know, for any artist working there, that was great. But in terms of building up, becoming, he potentially he was the new Disney. I mean, he could have been. Yeah. The, and, and Disney meaning Disney Studio, the big studio making movie after movie, hundreds of employees and everything at that time. But it, his interest wasn't in that area. I think he but probably on also. Area, there was nowhere else to work. You know? Yeah. I think he probably also suffered from the fact that he didn't have a Roy Disney to mm. rein him in. Yeah, he never did. He he went through a succession of producers and partners, and there were some really, really, really dark times there. I, I bet. But we all clung to this belief that we were something special was happening here, or had special what had happened there, and we were totally committed to doing it. 
And yeah. I think, you know, as I said, there were bad times and there were stresses, really big stresses and ridiculous things like working all those hours for no, no uh, overtime pay or anything. Mm -hmm. But we were there f from what I call that sense of mission. Mm -hmm. We really believed in animation. We really believed what he believed. And for, we wanted to be with him warts and all, you know, um, and, and they were very few warts. And, and if, and I don't mean Walt Disney, I mean the other Walt. Um, uh, <laughs> it, it was just, I, I sometimes, you know, I'd go home sometimes and say, God, am I going to, are we going to, we all felt like this in some ways that, you know, can we really stand this anymore, this pressure and pressure and pressure and everything? Mm. And then we sat down and thought, well, where else are we going to go? What else is there out there? And there was nothing. And, 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 and that brought a reality an artist reality to the situation. And so that's why we loved it there. And I, and, and I do regret leaving, but I did leave eventually, you know? Yeah. Can you tell me why you left? And I know you, I think you moved immediately into starting your own company. Is that right? Yeah. So what, so what happened just backtracking a little bit when you gave us that month off until January the 2nd, mm -hmm. I took a few days off. I came back and I started working on my own film. I was so inspired being in that place and going through all that amazing burn of getting that film done. I couldn't stop. The adrenaline was still going and everything. So I started, sat down and started animating my own film. But with, but with no intention of trying to leave his studio or? No, no, no intention at all. I, mm -hmm. For me, I was just making my own film. It was called Hokusai, an animated sketchbook. The artist, the Japanese artist, Hokusai, who did the beautiful, wave and Mount beautiful. Fuji, things yeah. like that. Uh, I loved his work. I saw his sketchbook and I said, this guy would have been an animator if, if that technology was alive and available to him. What if I animated some of his work? So I did a couple of experiments and animated some of his work. And he looked at my, and, and the, I was between commercials at that time because mainly we were working on commercials and on my desk was some Hokusai artwork. Dick didn't mind me working on it in his spare time if there was nothing else to do. And Frank Thomas said, oh, Hokusai, I love Hokusai, and, and, and came over and started talking about Hokusai. So we made this, this great connection through Hokusai. Wow. Anyway, when I did finish the film, um, what was very frustrating, the one frustrating thing at, at Dick's studio after the years had gone by, because I was there for about five and a half years, okay. towards the end of those five and a half years, we were – Dick was always promising us the Cobbler and the Thief, the film that he eventually got made. Uh, it took him 17 years to get to that point. Yeah. Partially along that way was this five and a half years I was there. We were constantly being promised, you know, work hard at the commercials, keep the standards high, keep winning the awards, keep on, keep on. We're going to do the movie one day. Mm. And, and I kind of ran out of days in the end. I got so burnt out with yeah. the promise of the movie and it never came. And he had other amazing uh, films offered to him that he turned down. Um, Watership Down was one of them. Oh, wow. Uh, Hobbit, the original Hobbit. The one that Ralph Bakshi wound up Ralph doing? Ralph Bakshi did originally. Oh and it would have been a very different film if he'd oh, done it. Oh, my gosh. And uh, you, you probably don't know, but there was a big famous 60s folk singer called Donovan. Yeah. He was like the English Bob Dylan. Right. And he came in with a film project that was so trippy and amazing, and that got turned down too. And, I, and after about four and a half to five years, I said, look, the, the film's never going to happen. He's never going to make this film. We're just going to be making these commercials, and I don't want to do that anymore. I finished Hokusai, and that won a British Academy Award. And well, on the basis well deserved, of that, by the way. I was able to set up my own studio. And that and that's really it wasn't a plan to do that. Yeah. But that's the way it unfolded. And it, so people came to me and said, Do you want to set up your own studio? We we'll back you. And on the strength of making that film and winning the award, and I took that chance. But so, even then, Dick was wonderful. He threw a big party for me at a, a famous uh, Turkish restaurant in London. Oh wow. And, had a big party. So I felt doubly bad about leaving. <laughs> but, <laughs> you had that business for 20 years. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, uh, animus productions, it was called. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, it went on for 20 years. We did quite a few things in that time. Again, my, my, I followed 
Dick Williams' model of use advertising to fund a bigger project. That was the plan always at Dick Williams' studio was make all this money on commercials and win awards and, you know, and with all that, we can make our own film. And yeah. for me, uh, Hokusai was the start of what I really wanted to do in terms of filmmaking. Yeah. Uh, but I followed, I adopted that commercials rule, you know, make the money out of the commercials, win some awards, and then you'll make your film. Well, yeah, but I didn't do it either. So, <laughs> and it took me 20 years to realize I'm not going to do this. The industry is not going to uh, back films. And that's when I moved to the States in the hope that I could do that here. I gotcha. So, so after those 20 years you came, did you come directly to Seattle or... Uh, I, I came to the Pacific Northwest okay. for, for, for a couple of reasons, some personal, some not. Um, but my feeling was that after 20 years, and we'd won so many awards also at Animus. Um, I did two TV specials for PBS. I did all kinds of things. Um, tried to get funding for movies. People loved our scripts. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the British the British attitude is not to take risks. And it's, you know, if you've done something that's been done before, yeah, we might back you, but like uh, a Christmas Carol. everything I did, I couldn't get funding for a first movie. Yeah. So my thinking was get to the States, set up the, a branch of the studio over there, um, start to attract investment because the States is where they make movies in hand-drawn animation. Um, you're going to find it a lot easier over there. And that was the plan. But yeah, the plan and, uh, didn't work. So and you also, part of not working was to come over here. I was I was not legal. I was on a visitor's visa, mm -hmm. and I had to sit it out until I got my full green card and work permit. And that took two and a half years. So I couldn't work here. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I had a contract to write a book, and I was living off that. And I cashed in everything. My life had changed. I got divorced. Before that, my kids, my two daughters had grown up. So this is the first uh, wife? wife, yeah. Mm -hmm. And my two daughters had grown up and started their own, let flown the nest more or less at that stage. And I thought, it's got to be now or never. I'm never going to get another chance. So, yeah. um, and that's why I took the chance. But as I say, I came over. It wasn't intended. I didn't, I knew I'd have to sit it out over here, but I didn't rationalize, I, I didn't, feed into the equation the fact that September 11 was going to happen while I was going through that process. Everything got slowed down with immigration and well, everything. Everything changed, really. Yeah. I, I mean, in the mid-90s is probably the highest point of um, fi you know, financial and, and creative success for animation probably yeah. since, you know, the 1940s. Uh, so there was, there was probably, you know, it was almost like a gold rush in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, did you, did you, was that, I'm sure that that was part of what was informing you to, to make the move to come to the States, right? Because you, at this point, maybe there was a DreamWorks, I think, pulling people from. Yeah. Like, Who Framed Roger Rabbit had come out yep. and was hugely successful. That was the, but prior to that, everything had been in decline. Disney, I, I remember going over to Disney, uh, being invited over to Disney because they heard I had a film project and they did actually show interest in one of my projects. And they said, come over and talk to us about it. We'll show you around. And this, and to, when to was it, that? I can't remember the date, but the perspective would be, they were making Tron at the time and no. the black cauldron. Okay. Early eighties. Yeah. And I was, and I was taken around and I was so depressed because I, I didn't, I saw some special effects, artwork for Tron, mm -hmm. but they showed me the black cauldron and I hated it. And, <laughs> and I thought this Walt must be spinning in his grave because this is, <laughs> they've reneged on his legacy. Yeah. Um, and I thought I was more, more inclined than ever to do something myself and, yeah. and try and re give birth to that legacy. But then Roger Rabbit happened and I'd broken away by then. So I, although Dick Williams was director of animation on that, I didn't work on it because I was busy with my own studio. But right. yeah, coming here, I thought this is the only place in the world at that time that had the consciousness of making animated films yeah. and making them as a business. Not that I'm a businessman, but the reality is 
people want to make money if they invest in things and I, and I can, I can deal with that. I yeah. can deal with, you know, I can find that balance between creative innovation and, and quality and the need for investors to make money. I'm okay on that. Uh, so, I wouldn't sell out. I wouldn't compromise, but I can talk the language that I understand their needs as well. And so I thought coming here, but, what fully scuppered that idea was the fact that six months after I finally got my green card and I got my work permit, it was something like a while after that, Disney closed down their hand-drawn animation studio. Mm -hmm. You know, Michael Eisner sold us all down the river, in my opinion, closed that studio, and the whole industry died overnight in this country. Yeah. It completely died where people were interested in investment. At the time, I was beginning to get interest in my projects. Uh, they said, sorry, if Disney are out of the business, we're out of the business, because if they can't make money out of it, um, no one can. Yeah. Yeah. And to give context too, back in the late 90s, as as many people will recall, these Disney films were becoming, they were just blockbuster films. You had, you had Aladdin, you had Beauty and the Beast, you had The Lion King, you had Pocahontas. I mean, these were juggernaut films. Yeah. They were competing with the biggest movies of, of the summer live action or what, or what have you, doesn't matter. And around that time, they, um, there was a, a split going on between Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was one of the creative heads. He was a creative executive who mm -hmm. moved, um, and joined forces with, uh, Steven Spielberg and David Geffen to start, uh, SKG, which was basically going to be a competitor for in the movie business with Disney. And at that point, they started to lure away Dis top Disney talent, uh, and a lot of the Disney talent started to have um, started to have uh, agents, just like movie stars did. And of course, huge contracts, huge it, it, contracts. exactly. And so you know, so these were you know, they were basically like the Tom Cruises of of the animation industry. And in addition to that, they were also seen as sort of celebrities because in the making of, quote unquote, making of these movies, like the making of uh, Lion King, making of, you'd always see these guys uh, being interviewed. So they had sort of celebrity status. Um, and so what happened was, is that they kept offering DreamWorks, what later became DreamWorks, started kept offering these top talent animators more and more money. Mm -hmm. And then eventually what happened was, is that, well, okay, we can't afford to pay these, all of these animators. I mean, even junior animators were making lots of money. They were being offered yeah. lots of money Huge just yeah. to, just to compete. And it became almost this game between Katzenberg and Michael Eisner. And in a lot of ways, I feel that that was a major part of the reason why the animation industry for, for hand-drawn animation and, and and the animation industry in general, and, and and the reason I say that is because, of course, we had the end at the advent of Pixar, you know, computer animation, which started to emerge right around the same time. Which is, I mean, talk about like, you know, killing two birds with one stone. I mean, I mean, you had you had all of that competition going on, and you had the advent of of three D animation. It was the perfect storm for for hand drawn animation to to crumble. Now, exactly. now what you see is with with hand drawn anim or with uh, computer animation is you do not have an there, it is very rare to have celebrity animators. They're all basically uh, keyboard pushers now. Nobody knows who they are unless you're you know maybe getting into the industry as a college student. You might know a a computer animator here and there, but really that celebrity status and that that sort of you know iconic status of 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 um animators is gone and so mm -hmm. that basically put them put animators at back under these in under this position of just being worker bees and that's it yeah and and and, so, and, that, yeah. and, and really you can trace that back uh, you're absolutely right and it did exist that hierarchy before the bubble burst, but it did exist, but it really goes right back to Walt because Walt Disney respected his, and yes, he saw them, his animators as the Tom Cruises of the film. And, uh, and so he invested in them. Yeah, and he was wise to it. Yeah. Re required them to be better and better than they were. 
and gave them every resource to make them better because he saw them as the actors in his film. Yep. And if, if, uh, if they can't do it, the film's not going to be good. And he would, or his other philosophy was to make films for generations of the future, not just to get it out next year and cash in on the window of opportunity. Yeah. His, his films were for generations. So when he died, his, his legacy continued on at the Disney studio but when the big rivalry between DreamWorks and Disney and the lawyers got involved and everything, all that other crap happened and that bubble burst, it all went. The apprenticeship mm-hmm. system at Disney went, everything went. Um, and even now, you know, the, a, a lot of animation is done for the games industry. And I've, I've, I don't know how many people I've asked in the industry, you know, who are the nine old men of games animation today? And there aren't any. Mm-mm. That there are no names no. anymore, no. Um, and because it, it's it's just a function of the of a sausage factory now. Mm-hmm. It's just you know get it moved, get it done. If it's not too bad, we'll accept it and get it through. Walt would never, Richard Williams would never accept that yeah. philosophy. Yeah. So you know, so it it was a really tough time to see that bubble burst. I did. I have to say, I did see it coming. Um, in order to survive, when I got my work permit, just going back to the story, when I got the work permit, uh, I thought, how do I survive here now? <laughs> I've burnt all those, but I ended up going to teach. And I found this really little school up here in the Pacific Northwest that doesn't exist anymore hmm. called the Henry Cogswell College in Everett. And um, I had a whole really exciting program that I developed there where part of the part of the process was to actually try in my tiny little microcosm way to adopt that Disney apprenticeship system yeah. of production. So we made a film. I, I wrote a film called Endangered Species, which is about the rise and fall and hopeful rise again of the 2D animation industry, <laughs> where I uh, had all my students working on the film like a production. We took a whole summer break, and the, even to the point where they had to apply for jobs on the production. And I would interview them, and they'd have to sign a contract, which was kind of a look-alike contract to what they would get in the industry. Awesome. And then they'd all work on the production. And that really was featuring that whole history of animation through my favorite sequences from uh, moments in the history of animation. And we recreated them in a film. Um, and the, be- the beautiful symmetry- symmetry of that is that at one point in the film, there's there's a spoof, uh, there's a tribute to Richard Williams' film, A Christmas Carol, just a couple of scenes briefly. Mm-hmm. And uh, Marley's Ghost, where he says, you don't believe in me, I, I made, I turned that into Walt Disney. Hmm. Like, telling the industry, you don't believe in me, my principles and everything. And I thought, I really want a Disney voice for that. I really want, <laughs> and through a friend of mine, uh, Nancy Beeman, who worked for Disney, she said, oh, I know Roy Disney, because I said, I wonder if Roy Disney will do it, Roy E. Disney will do it. And she said, I know him. So she wrote to him and cut a long story short, he actually did a recording of it. Uh, as as of Walt the, Disney? The voice. So I had the bloodline doing the voice of for Walt of Roy's nephew. That is so cool. Yeah, and, and, and that was at the time. I mean, I, I think I can tell this story now, but this was at the time. He was raging. He was fighting with Eisner for for the integrity of the studio. Yeah. And it's, this is another story for another podcast probably, yep. but when Roy broke away. And this is the early, broke, around the early 2000s, right? Yeah, he broke away and set up a website called SaveDisney.com to mm-hmm. fight for the Disney tradition that That's Eisner right. was destroying. And he actually, cutting that long story short, he actually succeeded in getting uh, – Michael Eisner out. Yep. Eventually, the shareholders voted him out of the company. Yep. But while that tra- that per- period in time, he Roy wasn't part of the Disney organization anymore. But people knew him and let him in. He actually recorded my the voice of Walt for me during a break in a Mary Poppins recording session, and it was all paid for by Michael Eisner's budget. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And I had seventeen technicians from one of their big productions in their lunch break. And I was on the phone in Everett, and Roy was in Burbank, and I was directing him on the phone. 
That's uh, awesome. And, and it was all being paid for by Mac license. <laughs> so you're talking about Mary, Mary Poppins, the musical that was going on. I, tour. I think it was whatever they were doing. He, he, yeah. he didn't really. Yeah. I think it was something like that, but I so, know Roy said, uh, just keep it quiet, but, um, we're doing this on um, Eisner's buck, you know, so. That's awesome. Okay, just send me the tape, and that's what <laughs> happened. And, and he eventually did a foreword as well, kindly did a foreword for my, uh, one of my animation books, uh, Animation from Pencils to Pixels. Yeah. And the biggest thing of all, he came and opened my animation festival. When I, I started an animation festival called the 2D or Not to D Animation Festival, the inaugural event, he flew in, and opened the whole thing for us. And he was just the most wonderful human being. And and am I wrong in that you were the instigator in starting the Roy E. Disney Award? Yes. That that was a really moving moment. So we he he said he would come and do the festival. He flew in. Uh we looked after him while he was here. And I also asked him, I said, Roy, I wanna set up a Roy E. Disney Award that is where we feel it merits it, the person who has most contributed in the past year to 2D animation, to traditional hand-drawn animation, would you mind me using your name for that award? And he said, no, I'd be delighted to do that. And I said, okay, would you mind presenting it to the award, the award when you come and open the festival? He said, no, I'd love to do that. So, so that's what happened. So uh, came up to... Uh, the, the Roy Disney Award, and I announced to the audience, I said, Roy has kindly given his name to this award, and it's to go to the person we feel who's made the biggest contribution to, to the animation, um, and Roy's going to present it, but instead, I think um, he needs to receive it, and we gave mm. him the first Roy E. Disney Award um, for his contribution to fighting for the legacy of Disney. Amazing. But, to try and do that. And so we all had tears in our eyes, including him yeah. when he received it. And, it's and, a beautiful bronze uh, statue thing. And also to bring it full circle, yeah. I think you should tell who who else you gave that award to. Oh, yeah. So years, a, a, a few years later, uh, there I was presenting that same award to Richard Williams. Uh, he came over... Um, he was promoting his um, his video series at the time. Was he aware that you were going to present it, or was it a surprise? No, it was a surprise. I asked him to come and talk to. I was teaching in a college, another a different, a new college at the time, and uh, would you come and speak to them? And he agreed to do it. That's a, um, that's, that's an amazing yeah, and story. Then, and then a, the, we, I haven't presented one for a few years now, but the last one went to Tom Moore for oh, um, nice. Secret of Hell's. Yeah. But his work on another, Secret of Cows. another great animator and another oh, yeah. great another great advocate for two D animation. Oh. Tony, we are running out of time. Unfortunately, okay. we, I still have so much to ask you. We're going to have to do a part two if you're available at some point. I'd be delighted. I, you know, can you tell us a little bit about? Um, do you have anything coming up uh, that you'd like to talk about, or where can we find you? And or where can we find you? You can find all my past uh, escapades on my. TonyWhiteAnimation.com website. I'm actually working on a, a new kind of branding thing called mm. Startoons.com. Mm. The, the weird thing about me, and, and very few people know this, probably people on Facebook who look at me in great suspicion, but my whole <laughs> career would never have happened, and I mean this very sincerely, would never have happened if it wasn't for me being given an astrological reading when I was a teenager. Oh, wow. I, I was in a very my mind was in a very scared state when I was a teenager, early teenagers. I couldn't even go to school through fear. I had nightmares. I had uh, illnesses that nobody could fix. I was under child counseling. My parents were wonderful, but they couldn't help me. And then my mother, who was also seriously, very seriously ill, doctors had given up on her. She decided to go to an herbalist astrologer. Mm-hmm. Uh, for treatment and bottom line is uh, he saved her life when doctors had given up on her um, wow. and uh, as part of that process she said to me look I'm getting better why don't you go to him and see if he can help you with all your issues and because uh, I couldn't even go to school some days I couldn't even go out the door to school mm. I was in a real mess I couldn't go anywhere and uh, I said okay 
Um, I didn't know whether I believed in it or not. But, but I swear this is absolutely true. In 30 minutes, he sat down with me and explained to me everything about me that I didn't know about inside me. Okay. Everything I was going through and why it was happening to me. And um, as a result of that, I completely rebuilt my view of myself and my view of the world. And that's when everything, including my college and everything else, opened up to me. And if it wasn't for that 30 minutes, I, would, I wouldn't have had my career. And so what I'm doing now, I've reached an age where, and I, I was in the closet on all this for all those years. I didn't mm -hmm. talk about my interest in astrology or metaphysics or anything mm -hmm. like that. But I've now got to a stage where I don't care. I don't yeah. care what people think of me in that sense. Um, and I want to give back what I got of that in that 30 minutes. I want to give back to people. So my, uh, I work as, uh, as, as a counselor to people now. Mm. Mm. Um, and I'm developing a project that's related to animation. I don't want to talk too much about it, but it, it's going to be a very unique project. It, it means the equivalent of me animating something like 132 half hour, uh, sorry, 30 second commercials. Uh, but when, when it's all done, essentially, um, I'll be tailoring animate, an animated film for each person. Um, and it will be very insightful and uh, intuitive. And, and basically, you order your, you'll order your film from me and it will be yours and there won't be two like it anywhere else. Oh, my gosh. Uh, but I have to build up that database. So that's what I'm doing. And it, people think I'm crazy, but I'm really not. Yeah. I, just, I just understand things that people haven't understood because they don't study it or they yeah. belittle it. But I really think that the time has come for something like this to happen. So that's what I'm doing. That, that sounds absolutely incredible. And, and you know, your the proof is in the pudding. I mean, if, the, if that 30 minutes actually uh, informed you on how you could change your life to, to have the kind of life that you've lived, I think uh, people should be listening. So, Well, I, I, I don't know, you know if everyone's going to have the same response to it, but there are yeah. people out there that will benefit from what I'm trying to do. I don't expect that everyone will be interested even, but I yeah. think uh, I'm doing it with integrity. I'm not doing it for money. And uh, it's my way of paying back for the life I've had. You know? Well, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing how that unfolds. And Tony... Uh, honestly, I'd love to have you back if, you, if you're uh, willing and able. And uh, this has been amazing. It, it went by incredibly fast. So we're going to have to do a part two for sure. Yeah. Tony, thank you so much again. I hope you have a great night and safe travels for your wife. And we will talk soon, okay? Okay. And long may you keep the pencil going. <laughs> awesome. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Pencil Pushers podcast. Follow us on Instagram at the Pencil Pushers Podcast for visual representation of our guest artwork, topics discussed, and anything else that contributes to the show. Be sure to subscribe. Tell a friend. Tell lots and lots of friends. Become a leadhead. And we're out.